Okay, so you know it's been said by many that the justice system of the United States of America is the greatest judiciary system in the world. Well, I don't know about that. I think in a perfect world that may be the case, but we are all human and we all make mistakes. And in the case of Daniel Villegas, the justice system not only failed him, it convicted an innocent man of double murder with no physical or forensic evidence whatsoever. He was sentenced to two life terms in the Texas state prison system without the possibility of parole for a crime he did not commit. Well, I'm sure you're all asking, how in the hell did this happen? You see, on the evening of April 21st, 1993, the El Paso Police Department showed up at Daniel's door with a warrant for his arrest for the murders of Armando Lazo and Bobby England. Within minutes, he was transferred to the police station, handcuffed to a chair, and grilled for hours by El Paso's top investigator, Alfonso Marquez. Daniel was then forced into signing a false confession that was misleading, full of lies, and totally fabricated by the very detective that arrested him. But how could a 16-year-old boy willingly sign a confession admitting to these murders if he had nothing to do with it? Did he truly commit this horrendous act? No, he didn't. And to top it off, it all started because of a lie. A lie in which Daniel told that would come to haunt him for the next 25 years. This is a case of imaginable magnitude that the city has never seen in almost 50 years. This is the true story of Daniel Villegas, El Paso's innocent man. So let's get into it.
So you're probably wondering how this mess all started. Well, back in 1993, four teenage boys were walking home from a party and found themselves in a not so great part of town. Yep. When all of a sudden they saw a large maroon colored vehicle appear out of nowhere. The car then started coming right towards them. When all of a sudden something unintelligible was yelled out in Spanish and bullets started flying in all directions. Two of the boys, Jesse and Juan, took off running in the opposite direction. They ran for what seemed like an eternity, only to find out that their two friends, Armando and Bobby, were not with them like they thought. They suddenly feared the worst. When they thought it was safe, they walked back to the scene to check on their friends. When they arrived, the police were already there. And to their dismay, they found their friends lying dead in the street, riddled with bullets. The El Paso Police Department was determined as ever to solve this shooting, no matter the cost. Over the next few days, they had questioned many individuals whose MO, modus operandi, fit the bill. But according to the official report, they had zero leads on this case until they decided to question a young man named David Rangel, who just so happened to be Danielle Villegas' cousin. Now, before I continue, I have to back up a little bit and tell you that a few days prior, uh, David and Daniel were on the phone. They were basically just uh, BSing and talking about what they were going to do uh, that weekend. And all of a sudden, it popped out of Daniel's mouth. Uh, hey, did you hear about those two boys that uh, got shot a couple of days ago? David said, yeah, what about it? Daniel said, or Daniel said, uh, I did it. I shot him with a shotgun. Well, you see, David was used to Daniel making up stories. He was used to Daniel pretending that he was a big shot, that he was very machismo by telling all of these stories in order to make himself look tougher than he really was. But, you know, that's just how Daniel was. And all of the family loved Daniel even though he told all these crazy stories and that was just his personality. Yeah, he just told all these stories just to make himself look like a big shot, to make, he was always funny, he was always laughing, and this was just who Daniel was. Okay, so a few days after he talked to Daniel on the telephone, his uh, mother, he walked in the door and his mother gave him a message that David needed to go down to the police station and sign some papers. No big deal, he thought. David had had a complaint with some other teenagers prior to the shooting, so he just basically assumed it was about that. Well, he couldn't have been more wrong. He was put into a room with Detective Marquez and suddenly he found himself being questioned about the murder of the two boys just days before. Marquez began saying, David, I know you were involved. Don't lie to me. Well, David stood his ground and wasn't and he said it wasn't me. So Detective Marquez kept threatening him saying he was going to go to prison for murder and with the stroke of a pen, I can make that happen. So after being under pressure for hours and hours and hours, he all of a sudden blurted out his cousin Daniel's name and said that he had confessed to him that he was the one who murdered Armando Lazo and Bobby England. But he told the detective that it was a joke. And that's just how Daniel was. He was known throughout the whole family as a storyteller. And that every single time he opened his mouth, they knew most of it was bullshit. But 
Detective Marquez wasn't laughing. Then, as suddenly as it happened, David was free to go. He was very confused. One minute he was being accused of murder, and the next he was set free. Okay, so you see, he was very confused. One minute he was being accused of murder, and the next he was set free. He didn't really understand the gravity of the situation he had just been in, or, to put it bluntly, whose fate he had ultimately sealed. Well, that same night, police officers went to the Villegas home and arrested Daniel for the murder of Armando Lazo and Bobby England. But before he left his home, his mother told him to stay quiet don't say a word, and she would get him a lawyer in the morning. <laughs> well, keeping quiet was never Daniel's strong suit, so Daniel found himself in the same interrogation room, handcuffed to a chair, sitting across a desk with Detective Al Marquez of the El Paso Police Department. Daniel was only 16 years old at the time, and according to Texas law, he could be interrogated by law enforcement officials without the presence of a parent or an attorney. He was interrogated into the wee hours of the morning, but Daniel said he was innocent. It was all a joke, and he wrote and signed an affidavit saying so. But Marquez crumbled it up and threw it in the trash. He also threatened Daniel by saying, and I quote, he was going to take him into the desert, kick his ass, let him walk back to the highway, and then pick him up again, kick his ass again, then throw him in jail with a couple of guys who would brutally assault him. So as you can imagine, Daniel was scared out of his mind. And after many hours of being slapped around, threatened, and interrogated, he finally relented. Detective Marquez got out his typewriter and began typing his own version of the events. He had Daniel sign it, and boom, that was that. And oh, by the way, it was later found out that Daniel had two supposed co-conspirators who gave statements implicating him. But then they later recanted saying they had been babysitting and watching movies all night with, guess who? Daniel. Hmm, sounds like an alibi to me, right? Uh, the charges against his two friends were dropped due to in insufficient evidence. And by the next morning, Daniel had finally come to his senses and immediately recanted his confession from the previous night to a social worker. But this did absolutely nothing. The state of Texas had a signed confession and that was as good as it was going to get. And Daniel's denials could not erase his signature at the bottom of that confession. Well, eventually Daniel's parents hired an attorney for the trial. The defense called 18 witnesses in Daniel's defense. But that damn confession stamped with his own signature was not doing him any favors whatsoever. And when the jury came back, they couldn't come to a unanimous decision. So it was therefore declared a mistrial. In the second trial, Daniel and his family could not afford a decent attorney, so a public defender was appointed for him. His attorney only called one witness in his defense, saying that the prosecution had the burden of proof, so it was up to them to prove he was guilty. So, don't worry, Daniel, it'll all work out fine. Uh, yeah, right. This lawyer was about as useful as a broken light bulb. 
Yeah. Well, you can probably guess, in the end, all the jury saw was that signed confession and found Daniel Villegas guilty of murder in the first degree. No witnesses, no fingerprints, no forensic evidence was found to link Daniel to the double murder. How in the hell is this possible? In this day and age, we all know that some type of forensic evidence must be needed or a credible witness must be found, right? Am I right? You know, these things are a must in order to find a defendant guilty of murder. But back in 1995, the jury legally could find Daniel guilty of murder on the basis of that confession and that confession alone. He was 18 years old at the time and was sent to prison for the rest of his life. This was a double murder that was completely lacking in any evidence whatsoever. Now for the record, it was found out later through the discovery that four other minors were interviewed and placed themselves at the scene of the crime just minutes before it happened. Early in the investigation, police had interviewed Rudy and Javier Flores, two brothers who knew England and Lazo, the deceased. Javier Flores and Armando Lazo had fought at school one day and Rudy Flores had gotten in a heated argument with England and Lazo at a party two weeks before the shooting. And threatened to kill Lazo. In addition, Javier Flores' car, which his brother Rudy occasionally drove, was similar to the one described by Juan Medina and Jesse Hernandez, the two boys who survived. And to top it all off, Rudy was seen just a few hours later firing that 22 caliber handgun. Officers responded to that shooting and confiscated the weapon. But ballistic tests were never released or in my own opinion, were never done in the first place. Well, despite these leads and others, Marquez and the other officers dismissed the Flores brothers as suspects. So therefore, no further investigation was needed since Villegas confessed. And according to authorities, no murder weapon was ever found. No vehicle was ever identified. There was no description of any per perpetrator whatsoever. No eyewitnesses. No forensic evidence was ever found that linked any other possible perpetrator to the crime. Witness statements did not match up. Physical evidence was non-existent except for six bullet casings found next to the bodies of the victims. The casings, get this, the casings were believed to be from a 22 caliber handgun. Gee, do you think it matched the 22 that the authorities confiscated from uh, the brothers the day before? Possibly. That's what I think. Personally, I think these cops were lazy and refused to do any, any real investigative work on this case. And the only proof they needed was that bogus confession. Nothing else mattered to them. They got their conviction and that was that. In the eyes of the law, the case was now closed. So Daniel's family was beginning to lose hope. They even wrote to the Innocence Project in the hopes that they could help. While they were waiting for a response, their former daughter-in-law, Lucy, had, in the years after Daniel was incarcerated, remarried a man named John Mambella. Now, you see, now Lucy used to date Daniel's older brother, but they had three children together. They broke up, and now she was married to another man named John. Uh, John Mimbella, you see, was a contractor by trade. He had taken his father's small family business and turned it into a multi-state construction firm. 
eventually gaining government contracts as well as residential work. He was a well-respected man of the community and almost everyone in town knew of John. So you're probably asking, how did he get involved in Daniel's case? Well, one evening he went with his wife Lucy to pick up her three daughters at their grandparents' house. This is Daniel's mom and dad, of course. And uh, he walked into the room and saw the entire uh, family crying. He asked what was wrong and they told him they just received word from the Innocence Project denying Daniel's case because they only work with cases that have DNA and Daniel's case, you know, there wasn't any DNA. John had read of Daniel's case in the newspaper and just assumed like everyone else, you know, he thought he was guilty. Because how could a jury convict an innocent boy of double murder without evidence to do so? The family was so heartbroken and sad that he felt like he had to do something. So Daniel's mother gave him a box of papers before he left and he told them he would look into it. He couldn't promise anything, but, you know, he said he would definitely try and see if he could do something. And he doubted rather Daniel's claims of innocence would amount uh, to much. But he took home the family, the family, he took home the box the family gave him. And uh, when he got home, he found it filled with hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. Uh, he sat every day after dinner and read through all of these pages, one right after another. He read the entire box, flipped all the pages over, and read them again. Read every single one of them, flipped the pile over, and he read them again. And by the time he had read them the third time, he was hooked. He finally figured out how could the state of Texas convict a 16-year-old boy of double murder without any physical evidence whatsoever. He was astonished. So after John read through all of the paperwork, he decided, you know, there was only one way to see the true measure of a man. John had to meet Daniel in person, one-on-one. -on -one. So he went to the prison Daniel was being held at and Daniel immediately began telling John all about what had happened to him, how they threatened and coerced him, even so much as telling Daniel by Detective Marquez, if he didn't make a statement of confession, he would, and I quote, get the electric chair and I'm going to personally fry your ass. So after talking to Daniel, he finally understood how someone under duress could give a false confession. And he made Daniel a promise that day. He would be with him through it all. No matter what happens, he would not abandon him. But Daniel thought after he left, how could this be? A strange man whom he barely knew? How was this possible? This has to be a dream, right? Well, Daniel had been praying all this time since he was incarcerated for a miracle. And he truly felt like John was an angel sent by God to answer his prayers. But you see, here was John, a man who knew nothing about the law. Where would he even begin? So John started where else but the yellow pages you guys remember that yep with a private investigator and he was told all good investigations start with a witness and that witness was jesse hernandez he was one of the boys who was shot at that fateful night well first thing they asked jesse is if he thought daniel was guilty he said and I quote, well, he was convicted of the murder of my friends, and that's pretty much that. 
So John then told him, well, do you know they never found the car or the so-called murder weapon? There were no fingerprints, no DNA, nothing except for a bogus confession. So Jesse said, do you have a copy of that confession? And John said, yes. So John gave it to Jesse. And as he read it, he told them, well, that's not how it happened. The confession was wrong. John asked him what was wrong about it. Jesse said, everything, everything is wrong. The direction the car was traveling, that was wrong. The type of car uh, th that they were driving, that was wrong. Uh, he didn't go down the way he said it did. So for Jesse, he had so many more questions of how could Daniel come to take the blame? He then asked John, who was this detective that interviewed Daniel? He told him, well, it was Al Marcus. Jesse almost fell off his chair and he blurted out that was the same guy who accused him of murdering his friends. Jesse had a remarkably similar story to Daniel's. Jesse went down to the station that night of the murders and wrote down his statement and all of a sudden Marcus crumbled it up and said, I know you did it. You killed your friends. Make a statement or I'm going to fry your ass. Gee, sound familiar? Sure does to me. Jesse said Detective Marquez nearly persuaded him into confessing if it wasn't for his own mother coming in at that very moment. She started screaming at all the detectives in the precinct and said, I'm going to sue you guys and sue the city for what you've done to my son. So Jesse's mother grabbed her son's arm and they walked out of the station. And that was the last time Jesse ever saw Al Marquez. You know, this detective Marquez and all of his Confederates are dirty to the core. Yep. I have no idea how these jack wagons sleep at night uh, doing this kind of shit to these kids. I have no idea. Anyway, once John heard Jesse's account, he knew he had enough evidence to go to court. But there was only one way. It was considered the long shot of long shots. It's called a writ of habeas corpus. Very rarely successful in any case. But still, in September of 2009, John's lawyers submitted a claim that an individual's constitutional right of unlawful imprisonment is being violated. Also claiming that he had ineffective counsel at his last trial. It would be given to the El Paso DA, Jaime Esparza, who, by the way, convicted Daniel back in 1995, and he then would make a recommendation whether or not to recommend or reject the claim. Well, as you may have already guessed, Esparza recommended Daniel's writ to be rejected. So it eventually landed on the docket of Judge Sam Madrano. The DA expected Judge Madrano to read over it and throw it out immediately. But to the surprise of everyone, the judge ordered a hearing with witnesses and all, with live testimony in order to make his decision. So John Mambella hired the best trial lawyer he could find in the state of Texas. And that was Joe Spencer. The hearing was expected to take mm, maybe three days at the most. But then the testimony began with police officers, experts, alibi witnesses, more experts. They all testified in great detail. One by one, they went through everybody. They brought in all the witnesses Daniel's alibi, his friends he had said he had been with watching TV and babysitting. They were there. 
They also testified under oath that Alfonso Marquez, their their you know great detective uh, of the El Paso Police Department, had uh, basically coerced them as well into writing a false t- a false statement in order to convict that. Daniel. Also, the names of Rudy and Javier Flores were brought up in court. Remember, they had gotten in a fight with Armando Lazo at the party, and they threatened Mondo that they would kill him, and two weeks later, Armando is dead. Coincidence? Well, I don't believe in coincidences. But by this time, Javier had died in a car accident, and his brother Rudy was serving an 18-year stretch at a federal prison uh, for drug trafficking. But Judge Medrano issued a bench warrant for old Rudy Flores, ordering him to appear. But before he got to court, Flores told prosecutors he was not involved in the murders. But... Joe Spencer decided to cross-examine him anyway. And of course, that son of a bitch, you know, he took the fifth. Mr. Flores, I intend to ask you about the contents of the statement that you gave to Detective Al Marquez. I refuse to answer any questions. I am involved my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. Detective Al Marquez uh, picked you up just to speak with you at least three or four different times. Isn't that true? I refuse to answer any questions. I am invoking my Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So now it was finally time for Daniel to take the stand and tell his side of the story of how he was coerced into confessing to a crime he did not commit. He told it in great detail, accusing Detective Marquez and the El Paso Police Department in open court of all of their dastardly deeds. Yep, the hearing itself was expected to last only a couple of days, but it went on and on for days and was spread out over a six-month period. Now, It was up to Judge Medrano to decide if Daniel would be granted a new trial. To the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals that the applicant Daniel Villegas' request for a new trial should be granted. But for now, Daniel was a free man of sorts. So he went on with life. He got married had children, he got a job with John's company, Mimbella Construction, but his freedom was limited, and every day he wondered if there would be another trial, and eventually he would be sent back to prison. It was constantly in the forefront of his mind, but in the meantime, Daniel's legal team won the right to have that damn confession thrown out once and for all it would not be used as evidence in open court anymore and because of this daniel's legal defense would hope that the bogus confession now that the bogus confession was thrown out that da esparza would finally drop the case well (laughs) that wasn't the case So a brand new trial would begin on October 2nd, 2018. But then, wouldn't you know it, the DA offered Daniel a plea deal. A deal with strings, I might add. It's called an Alford plea. An Alford plea is a guilty plea of a defendant who proclaims he is innocent of the crime and admits that the prosecution has enough evidence to prove that he is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It is entered when when the accused, together with his attorney, has made the calculated decision to plead guilty because the evidence against him is so strong that it will likely lead to a conviction. So... Basically, it means Daniel doesn't have to admit to murder, doesn't have to say he's guilty. He can say that he is innocent, 
but has to admit that the state of Texas has enough evidence to convict him, so therefore it means he's guilty and innocent at the same time. So, uh, he would be looked at as a convicted felon for the rest of his life as well. So, it would not clear his name. He would be a convicted felon and, uh, after being in jail and going through all of these and jumping through all of these hurdles, you know, this was something he really had to think about because he had a family now. He was married. He did not want to go back to prison. Uh, definitely not. But, you know, this seemed like a nice gift wrap. Uh, box with a bow on top so he didn't have to go to prison but on the other hand he would be considered and looked at as a convicted felon so on October the 2nd of 2018 the trial started once again all of El Paso was watching it was the biggest trial the city had ever seen in the last 50 years so without that bogus confession, the prosecution had to find another way to tie Daniel to the murders. So they started by calling his cousin, David Rangel, to the stand once again. David admitted on the stand that Daniel had told him that he had shot those two boys with a shotgun over the telephone that so long ago when they were 16 years old. And David at the time knew that he was joking, but when he was in front of Detective Al Marquez, he got scared. He was also being accused of murder and he just blurted out Daniel's name. He knew that Daniel was not guilty of these murders, but for some reason, when he was sitting there having, you know, being slapped in the head and being told you're going to prison and I'm going to fry your ass, you know, he was trying to defend himself and he decided to, you know, he just blurted out Daniel's name. So after the prosecution cross-examined uh, David it was Joe Spencer's turn. And Joe Spencer cross-examined David and he was able to tell the story of how Detective Marquez fabricated his statement, claiming that David came to the police station on his own that day, providing the so-called statement willingly against his cousin Daniel, or else he would pin the murders on him. Holy cow, this is a police officer who has made an oath to stand forthright and uphold the law, and he is actually doing the opposite. I cannot freaking comprehend this at all. It literally makes me question everything I know to be true, and it literally makes me sick. Well, with that, the defense rests, and the jury filed out of the courtroom to deliberate Daniel's fate. So they were all called back to the courtroom to hear the jury's decision. Daniel was so overcome with emotion, he could barely stand. He didn't know if he would be found innocent or be sent back to prison for the rest of his life. And the only way to tell you this story and tell you how it ends is for you to see for yourself in which... I believe is one of the most dramatic courtroom endings I have ever seen in my life. Here, take a look. If the defendant will please stand. In the District Court of El Paso County, Texas, 409th Judicial District, the state of Texas versus Daniel Villegas, number 940D09328. Verdict form B, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of- <laughs>
Mr. Villegas, you are no longer under any conditions in this court. You are free to leave. Good luck to you, sir. You know, it brings tears to my eyes just sitting here thinking about that clip you just saw. And Daniel was finally found innocent. A unanimous verdict in favor of a man who had spent his formidable years behind bars, convicted of a crime he did not commit. He now and will forever be seen by the great and sovereign state of Texas as an innocent man. In the following years, John and Daniel have found themselves a new calling of sorts. They have created a nonprofit organization called ProclaimJustice.org. It is designed to help those just like Daniel and dedicated to winning freedom for victims of wrongful conviction. If you would like more information about this website, I will have it linked down in the description box below. So that is it everyone. That is the very happy ending of the case of Daniel Villegas. Uh, it truly does touch my heart. And when I first watched several videos on this case that other YouTubers have done, I literally cried tears of joy at the end. It was truly, truly heartwarming. And to think that a little white lie of sorts uh, almost ruined his entire life. And in fact, it ruined 25 years of his life. And I think that should teach us all that, uh, you know, everything that comes out of your mouth does have consequences. It really does. So... I am so glad for Daniel and his family and his kids and for John Mimbella. I am so happy that this angel of mercy, so to speak, uh, just came along a contractor by trade. He just came along and decided, you know, had a calling from God and decided to help Daniel. And he did. He helped Daniel win his freedom. And it just warms my heart so much to know that there are people out there that do great things for, you know, basically a stranger. Uh, John and Daniel are now best of friends and they work together on this, on this project to help other victims of wrongful conviction. And it's just, it's so amazing. I just love endings like this. I really do. So anyway, that's enough chatting. Uh, that is it, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you love this video, remember to give it a thumbs up. That really helps me out. Also remember to hit the post notification bell down below so you will be notified of all of my videos in the future. I thank you for watching, everyone. And I will see you in the next one. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.